Hi guys, thank you for showing up this late in the day. Um, everybody's caffeinated and ready to go. Let's top it off with a nice talk. Okay. Uh, so, uh, my name's Ketan, and my colleague here, Anand, we both will be talking about how our journey through taking you know, Flink on Kubernetes. Uh, so, the, uh, let's do a quick agenda. We'll go through a primer on Kubernetes, uh, a little bit of the background of what, uh, how, how currently Live deploys uh, a Flink on, uh, in, on our regular EC2 machines. Uh, the solution, which is the Flink Kubernetes operator a demo, and so on. Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you are aware of Kubernetes or used Kubernetes? Wow. Okay, aware. Everybody's aware. Uh, how many of you have used it in production? Okay, so it's a lot of people. So you know, some of the talk might be a little redundant. Uh, it caters to a wider audience, but I'll try to go through faster and focus on the core. Uh, so a quick history, uh, Kubernetes, as everybody knows, uh, was started at Google. Basically, it's the open source version of its internal infrastructure, uh, internal infrastructure called Varg and Omega. Um, and I think Google was one of the first companies that was running containers in production before Docker existed. And then they came out with Kubernetes, and Docker happened, and uh, the world changed. So uh, Kubernetes is essentially an orchestration engine that allows you to create uh, deployments uh, and manage applications at scale uh, using containerized uh, or, or using containerized applications. You have to specify the CPU, GPU, memory, or disk requirements for the application, and then it goes and uh, gets that machine for you. Uh, but diving a little deeper into Kubernetes, uh, one of the essential uh, components or concepts in Kubernetes is a pod. A pod is can be seen like a virtual machine. It's not really a virtual machine. There is no hypervisor. There are, uh, essentially, it's a group of containers. A pod has an IP address, uh, and it has no durability guarantees. The, the containers inside a pod can talk to each other over localhost, uh, which makes it look like a virtual machine. And, uh, but you can have multiple pods running on the same node. Once you know what a pod is, there are many other concepts, uh, especially, uh, I'll just focus on a couple which we will uh, talk about when we talk about the Flink Kubernetes operator. <clears throat> a couple of those concepts are, one of them is uh, deployments. Deployments, I think Till mentioned them in his talk. Uh, deployments are essentially a way to deploy changes to pods uh, and to Kubernetes. Uh, a service is an abstraction that allows you to communicate uh, with a set of pods. It's like a load balancer. Uh, but only within the cluster. Now, if you want to reach to the pods from outside the cluster, you have a concept called as ingress. Uh, and finally, there's a controller. Controller is essentially a control loop. We'll talk about it in a minute. That allows you to deploy and manage a pod. So, now that we know some concepts, let's take, let's dive even further deeper. You know, look under the hood of what. Uh, the architecture of Kubernetes is. Kubernetes is a very classical cloud-native architecture. Consists of two planes, a control plane, which is just responsible for all control operations, and a data plane, which is responsible for actually carrying out uh, the various operations for the user. Uh, so if you want to start a pod, the, the request to start a pod goes to the control plane. In this case, it goes to the API server. It stores it into a database, as always, uh, and the database here is etcd. Um, and then uh, the scheduler and the controller manager together cause the actions to happen in the data plane. The data plane consists of kubelet and uh, kproxy uh, or kubeproxy. Uh, the kubelet is essentially like an agent that whenever, it, whenever a kubelet comes up, the only thing it knows is where do I find my control plane? And it goes and connects to the control plane. New nodes get added as the kubelets come up. And then it waits forever till the control plane tells it to do an action. And in this case, uh, the kubelet is told, let's start a pod. Uh, the kubelet will go ahead, start a pod. Now the pod wants to communicate with, let's say, other pods. The only way it can communicate is through the known IP addresses, which are these virtual IP addresses within the Kube, uh, Kubernetes cluster. So it uses kubeproxy to talk to each other. Uh, so this is, uh, at a very high level, uh, the architecture of Kubernetes. 
but the most important thing that we, I glossed over was that when you request for a part, the controller manager and the scheduler together do something. And that's called as the control loops. A control loop is it's a foundational piece in Kubernetes. And it comes from uh, industrial systems, uh, industrial control systems. Uh, essentially, it consists of three things. One thing is observe, act, and uh, make sure that the acted thing is reaching an intended state. So the intended state is the request from the user. So let's say I, I ask for start me a pod. That is the intended state. Uh, and, uh, and the pod currently, currently if I go and observe, in the cluster, whether it has a pod or no, you'll return saying that there's no pod. So the actual state is there is no pod. So I want to now create an action. And the action is start a pod. I call kubelets and I say like, let's start a pod. Uh, after a while, the pod comes about. Now the actual state has changed. The actual state is there is a pod running. So I go and modify my intended state status saying that yes, the pod is running. Later on, the pod dies the actual state has deviated from my intended state. So you can bring back the part. And this keeps on happening forever, unless there is a, there is a termination signal that you have created in the system. So, and this is the cornerstone for all of Kubernetes. Everything in Kubernetes runs in the same way. Uh, and this gives you auto recovery protocols. So uh, another very interesting thing uh, that has been, that is a recent addition to Kubernetes is this thing called as custom resources. Custom resources allows Kubernetes to extend, uh, or us to extend Kubernetes APIs uh, optionally. So that means you can dynamically add a behavior to Kubernetes that it did not know about yesterday. For example, you can teach Kubernetes to start Flink applications, or you could teach Kubernetes to start a database, or in some other cases that we are doing, you can teach Kubernetes to run workflows. Um, how do you do that? You basically specify a definition called custom resource definition, to Kubernetes, and then you write a controller that does the same control loop, looks at the definition, which is the intended state in this case, creates the action, which is the actual state, maybe it's start a Flink application, and then keeps on doing this again and again till, till the intended result is achieved, which is Flink application runs forever. Uh, later on, uh, uh, after the custom resources came in, CoreOS wanted to do some marketing around it, and they coined the term operators. Very different from uh, Flink operators that we talked about entire day. I did not know that they were called operators that much. So uh, that gives a funny story I'll talk about later. Uh, but the operator here is essentially the control loop and the custom resource definition together is referred to as a operator. And this term was coined like last year and there was a big blog post and a lot of people are building operators now. So it's, it's worked. Uh, but it's a very interesting concept. It's very simple because you can now define custom resources and you can manage really complex applications. Uh, and there is a nice library that uh, they have been contributing to. It's still in beta, but uh, it's improving every day. It's called uh, Controller Runtime. I would recommend, go, uh, please look at it. Uh, and there's even a higher level library called Operator SDK. Look at that too. Okay, so we talked about Kubernetes. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast, or hopefully I didn't go too slow, if you knew everything about it. But uh, how does all of this relate to why we are here? So at Lyft, about a couple years ago, we started building this thing called a Splite. It's essentially an orchestration platform on top of containers. Uh, it's a declarative system uh, where you declare everything and it goes and uh, executes uh, stuff in the back for you. There's no machines to manage. There's uh, it just works. Uh, but at that time, what happened is our counterparts, which are the streaming platform at Lyft, started building streaming applications or, or allowing users to build streaming applications on traditional infrastructure. And we were like, huh, this is going to cause an interesting problem because the same people who build uh, streaming applications also build applications on our platform. And the way it works is because we essentially focus on machine learning uh, uh, type workloads, and they are very uh, iterative, repetitive, and like batch style. Uh, but many times the, the final model is delivered to a real-time system. And so how does this interact? We started thinking about how is this going to interact with the future? And this led to us you know, going and observing 
the legacy stack a little bit. And we went over and it's like, ah, okay, there's an AWS, it's an a AWS service, or it's hosted on AWS. And uh, it seems this is the traditional way. We run uh, job managers as separate uh, auto scaling groups. We run task managers as separate auto scaling groups. Uh, we run Zookeeper to have, but in case we want HA, otherwise we run a single job manager and if it dies, we lose everything. Uh, the machines are provisioned using salt stack. Uh, every deployment needs you know, provisioning of machines. And <clears throat> the user started running multiple, the moment there is a friction that you add to the user, like for example, every time you say for every application, you have to start a bunch of machines, you have to go through and create all of this salt stack, you have to create a repo in our case, people start doing crazy things. And in our case, what they started doing is running multiple applications on the cluster. And uh, if everyone's aware, what happens with multiple applications? Multi-tenancy, and that's not, uh, it, from my observation, it's not a strong point. So we were like, this is interesting, this multi-tenancy. There is, uh, and Kubernetes is great at that, at least, you know, in 90% cases, except for networking. Uh, and the isolation model of, of containers is, it can be leveraged. Uh, so we were like, hey, let's, hey, streaming folks, you know, what if we collaborate with you guys, build an operator, and see how it goes from there. Uh, and that's how we started an effort within our team called the Flink Kubernetes Operator. And uh, I'll hand over to Anand to actually talk more in details about that. Uh, thanks, Kitan. So Kitan went over the concepts of Kubernetes. I want to show you guys how we brought all these concepts together uh, to build a control plane where all of Flink application can be managed. Uh, but before we, we started building this, uh, our main goal was to abstract the users from hosting and managing all the infrastructure related to running a single Flink job. Uh, what are, when I say users, uh, Lyft has a lot of teams and each team have their own business use case to solve like locations, pricing uh, or you know fraud and they all have multiple jobs that they want to run and uh, in the traditional system what they do is they would first bring up the cluster and then as much as possible they'll try to fit as many jobs in a single cluster and then once that happens things start breaking and you know they start uh, managing it accordingly so our main goal was to abstract away all of these issues from the user a user should just be able to you know work on his business use case and all of the aspect of running a Flink in production in a cluster should be taken, should be abstracted away from them. Uh, so as a part of this, we wanted to explore about running a single Flink job in a single Flink cluster. Uh, let me explain what I mean by a Flink cluster. I'm, I'm referring to a virtual Flink cluster in Kubernetes. Uh, for us to achieve a single Flink job in a single Flink cluster, the main aspect is to make sure that the Flink cluster is lightweight. If it's a heavyweight uh, thing, then you know they're anyways going to, going to go through the same problem of managing it and you know, uh, dealing with it. So, uh, so our main goal was to make sure things are abstracted. We are able to run hundreds of jobs. Each team is able to run hundreds of jobs on their own, and all this complexity is abstracted away from them. So, Ketan talked about custom resource definition. Uh, I'm going to go in depth as to how a custom resource definition within the Flink application looks. So here is an example of a custom resource definition. I'm calling this as a Flink application. Uh, this is different from the Flink job because within the context of Flink, there is a job. So consider the Flink application as this custom resource and a Flink job as one of the parameters within the resource. So let's say a user comes to, comes to us and say, hey, I just want to run a Flink job. What do I have to do? Essentially, all you have to do is create this custom resource in Kubernetes. Uh, so according to our model, each custom resource will create a single Flink cluster, which will run a single Flink job. Uh, the whole thing is, works in, in this ecosystem works because our Docker images are runnable. Uh, that is one of the main things that I want to highlight. I'll show you more in my demo. Uh, each of us, of the Docker image has both the Flink code or the Flink bits and also the application jars built into it which makes sure that the operator is not just able to bring up the clusters, but also manages the end-to-end -end pipeline. So now let's revisit the Kubernetes cluster that uh, Ketan mentioned. Similar to 
uh, what Ketan mentioned, there's a control plane and a data plane. Now, a user, if he wants to start up a Flink application or Flink job, he will create a custom resource by talking to the API server. The custom resource is stored in etcd. The moment the uh, any resource is created, updated, or deleted in the etcd, the operator starts getting even, start listening to events about this resource, and the logic around control loop, the, what, like what is the actual state and what is the desired state, is what the operator does. I'll go in depth about the state machine within the operator, uh, but essentially the, what, what the operator does is it creates and manages this virtual Flink cluster. Uh, within the Flink cluster, there are four different components. Uh, you can just say uh, three components if you are categorizing deployment. So one is a job manager deployment, a task manager deployment, the job manager service which routes all the requests to all the pods in the job manager, and the ingress which is basically for the UI for the external client. So this grouping is what I'm referring to as a Flink cluster. Uh, so whenever you create a new CRD, uh, the operator ensures that there is a separate Flink cluster for your particular uh, application, and there is also a job running within it. So let's actually go through some of the internals of the operator before I go to the demo. So within the operator, what we have employed is a state machine. So the operator, what essentially it does, it looks at the current state, and it decides, it does a diff with the existing cluster and says, hey, hey, what is the action that I, the operator has to take to move to the next particular state? Uh, the goal of the operator is to make sure that all the custom resource definitions are always uh, in the desired running state. So let's say, for, uh, for example, let's walk through an example. Let's say you, you want to create a new Flink job. You write a new custom resource definition in Kubernetes. So now you are essentially in the new state. Uh, once the operator gets an event, it looks at the cluster. It says, hey, there is no but corresponding Flink cluster for this application resource. So it goes and creates a cluster and pushes the state to the starting state. In the starting state, uh, the operator, what it does, it makes sure that the pods all come up. Uh, sometimes what happens is that your cluster might be fully utilized, which means that new nodes need to be added uh, to the cluster and uh, the pods take time to come up. Uh, so in the starting state, the operator makes sure that all the pods are up and running. Once all the pods are ready and up and running, it pushes to the ready state. The ready state, at the ready state, uh, the operator makes sure that the flink is ready to take requests. Sometimes what we have noticed is that uh, the, the pods are all up, the job manager is up, the task manager is up, but uh, there is a leader election happening. Uh, the zookeeper uh, might be throwing errors, or sometimes what happens it might be recovering from a previous job. There may be a job running in uh, which is just going to start up. So the ready state essentially makes sure that the Flink is ready to take uh, REST API request. And once Flink is ready to take REST API request, we go up, uh, go and submit a job if there is no job that has that is running in the cluster. If there is run, something running in the cluster, we just switch to the running state. So now what you have is we essentially have a Flink cluster which is running a Flink job and it's all in running state. Now let's say what someone wants to you know, change a bunch of code, fix a bug, now deploy their code to production. What happens is that the moment you hit deploy, uh, the CRD gets updated. Uh, this also would be a part of my demo. So once the CRD is updated, now again the operator starts doing, doing the check of to making sure that, hey, is the Flink cluster that is running corresponding to the image uh, that is in the CRD. And once you update the image, uh, your, uh, the operator recognizes that uh, there is a mismatch, and it pushes the uh, state to an updating state, where in the current uh, case, what we do is if there is a change in the image, we cancel the corresponding job with the save point, uh, bring up the new cluster with the new image, and then start uh, the job in the new cluster, uh, to make sure that you know, and then once you start the new job, we, we go back to the previous slide where it again goes from new to starting to ready to running. A lot of talking, let me just uh, go over and show you demo. So uh, for my first demo, I'm gonna show you uh, a very simple streaming example, mainly because this is very famous, or very popular in the Flink examples. 
So essentially what I'm doing is I'm just running the state machine example job. Uh, let me just go over a little bit of the CRD details. So the uniqueness of the CRD is the name. So make sure we, there's a name and there's a namespace. The namespace resides where the pods will also be running. So we actually use the namespace provided in the application to make sure that all the pods and deployments are also running in the same namespace. Uh, we also have a Fling config uh, in our spec. This is essentially an override. Uh, so, so, uh, one thing that we, I will show you is that in our image, we also have a default set of configs, which are uh, which is an override of the Fling's default. So there is an override of the Fling default within the image, and also a custom override that each application can uh, add uh, to any of the uh, uh, to, to, to the existing uh, default values. Uh, on top of that, we also take uh, information about what is the size of the resource you want, what is the size of the task manager, how many CPUs, how many memory you want, and also the number of task slots. Uh, the, the number of task managers is determined based on the parallelism and the number of task slots. So, so, so first, let me just show you guys that <laughs> this is uh, something is happening. Ah, uh, just one second. <laughs> uh, my VPN has been disconnected. <laughs> the network not is my this thing off? Yeah, network not connected. Oh, my Wi-Fi is off. Just one second. Yeah, uh, always happens during the demo. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to first create the resource. We're going to see the state transition happening, all the resources that are going to get created, and also I'll also do an update and see how the state transition goes to the new, new image. Nice, so obviously there are no pods right now. Let me first create uh, the custom resource. So what I have done is I have literally created this particular resource in Kubernetes. And let us just look at the logs you know, uh, in the operator to see what has been happening. So this, this is the highlight that I want to show up. So the first step, what's happening is that you can see that uh, the application is actually in the new stage, is actually an empty string here. Uh, it decides that there's no corresponding cluster in Kubernetes. So what it does, it, it creates a cluster, which like I explained, and it pushes the uh, operator to the starting state. The starting state is where the pods are all literally coming up. Uh, once the pods are coming up, the operator just pushes it to a ready state. Uh, we can also see all of this in the Kubernetes UI, which is pretty cool. So now, yeah. So now it looks like uh, all the pods are up. Uh, let's check the UI. So before I be actually show the UI, I also want to show. So now you can see that uh, the, since all the pods are up, uh, the operator submitted a job based on what is specified in the CRD, and this is the job ID. Uh, and and now the operator is also continuously monitoring. If the CRD is actually matching uh, with what is running in the cluster. So let me just go and update it. So what I have is I have copied the same thing into a new file. But what the main thing that I've changed is uh, I've also changed the task manager config. Now I'm not specifying any resources just to make sure that I want a different set of resources. And I also updated my image. So typically what would happen is you change your code, you build an image, you deploy to a Jenkins pipeline. And once the Jenkins pipelines arrives at Kubernetes, the CRD gets updated. This is the standard process where you deploy a code. Now let's try to just cook this up. Oops. So literally you know, what just happened is the second step where the operator co continuously monitors the running state. Oops. Okay, yeah, it's safe pointing. So 
So you can literally see that what's happening is that the first set of clusters is being uh, killed off by the operator after canceling the job at the save point, and uh, the second set of clusters just brought up. Uh, once the readiness action is one out of one, you will see that the UI and the operator is able to kick off the job. The pods need to be ready for the operator to submit the job, the new job. And now, once the operator is ready, you can actually see that the UI is also up and running. Uh, sometimes, so. Uh, so I want to go through one more example, but before I go through the example, uh, I want to actually show you how we have created the image, uh, which is what the second part of the puzzle is. Even though the operator does all of this management of deployment and managing all of these Spring clusters, what runs within the cluster is also pretty uh, important. And we use uh, OpenShift source to image tooling to build images so that you know our users don't have to uh, know how to build uh, the image. So for example, if you want to run a job inside Fling, the jars needs to be in a particular folder, and that folder name needs to be part of the Fling config. So all these like, like, intrinsic details uh, are all part of the source to, uh, uh, source to image tooling, and our users literally do not have to do anything. All they have to do is just write a, uh, a Java code with uh, form.xml, and we essentially build the jars, make sure the, make sure the jars are all in the right folder, and the image is built. Uh, let me just show you exactly what I mean uh, over here. So if you look at this uh, thing, so what literally means is that we make sure that the web folder is uh, is in the web thing, web upload, and all the jars are part of that folder. And also what we have done is we, ha we literally have a, our own recommended set of Fling configs. So we don't want our application users to play around with all the config values. So what we have done is we have literally kept all of the recommended config values in the in our builder image uh, repository to make sure that uh, you know they don't have to go and mess with all the values, but at the same time you can always override your own values. So uh, this is pretty cool. Like you can have all the things built into the image and also use the CRD uh, to override a bunch of images. At the last part of my demo, I just want to show all the extensions to uh, that that we have. So at Lyft. We are completely migrating even our stateless service from a non-Kubernetes environment to a Kubernetes environment, which means that uh, all of our Kubernetes applications uh, have stat support, uh, metric support, uh, loggings, which means that we want to use the existing logging and the metrics infrastructure, which is, which is used in the non-streaming world, also along with, uh, with Flink applications. Uh, one more use case is Envoy. Uh, Lyft uses uh, Envoy for all of you know, microservice communication. And if someone wants to communicate to an existing microservice from a Flink application, that should also be very easy. So for to enable all of this, uh, what, what Lyft has worked on is, is something called as uh, Kubernetes webhooks. So essentially what Kubernetes webhooks are, based on the set of annotations and, uh, sorry, and uh, the labels, as a part of the custom resource, the web hooks kicks in and it adds additional containers to the existing pod. Uh, I'll also show you some uh, some of the examples. So essentially, what uh, what this means is that we say that hey, whenever there's an annotation called stats inject or a secret inject, make sure that all the secrets from Confidant, which is open source, are also part of the image or or, or part of the container. So essentially, like let's say if you have to talk to a Kafka topic. Uh, you need a password, username, and password for Confluent, or uh, let's say you want credentials from AWS. So all of that is part of Confidant, and using this annotation, all of this is magically pushed into the uh, into the containers. Uh, the second piece is also uh, like in this case, I have both metrics and the Confidant, but you can do the same for Envoy and uh, other stuff as well. 
Uh, the last thing that I wanted to show up is that uh, at lip, we run uh, our Flink uh, in high availability mode uh, with a single job manager. In our legacy system, we only have a single job manager, which means that if the job manager dies, it comes up uh, with a Zookeeper backend and it, reco it recovers automatically. Uh, but in the Kubernetes world, we want to run multiple job managers, uh, basically mo more like two job managers, where one is an active job manager and the second one is a standby. Uh, even in our examples, you, uh, you can see that whenever there are jo multiple job managers, we have modified our service to have a readiness probe to make sure that any request to the, to the job manager service is always routed to the leader of the job manager. Uh, and that you can actually see, I'll, I can show it over here. This is him. So here, if you essentially see the job manager service, it routes all the requests to the job manager pods. And let's say if you have multiple pods, I mean, if you have a stand-up uh, or a backup job manager, you don't want all the Flink requests to go to the, to the job manager which is in standby. So to order to facilitate that, we have a readiness probe on the service, which keeps polling the job manager to check who's the leader. And essentially what that ensures that all the requests to the job manager service are always routed to the leader job manager. I showed you guys the demo, and how is all this integrated within the Lyft ecosystem? So Lyft uses Jenkins for deploying code. Uh, this is not just for uh, play, uh, you know, streaming applications, but for all kinds of applications. Uh, so essentially, in, in any Jenkins environment, you have a staging uh, cluster where you deploy your staging code, make sure that things are correct, your metrics are fine, and then you go to Canary on staging or uh, production. So all of this is all available in the current uh, world as well. So essentially what happens is the moment you push the Jenkins uh, pipeline, we run the apply uh, command, the kubectl apply command is run to create or update the, co the corresponding custom resource and the deployment will continuously poll the status of the custom resource. Uh, for example, I, I did not mention to show you guys the Right. So if you, if you check this phase, the phase is actually in, in running. So what literally the deployment does is the deployment continuously monitors the phase of the application that it has created or updated. And if the phase moves to fail, it means that something has uh, happened and something has gone wrong and it fails the deployment. So literally like any other deployment story in a non-Flink uh, world, uh, we are trying to mimic the same uh, ecosystem for a Flink application as well. Uh, lastly, I want to also talk about some of the future extensions that we are planning. Uh, so if you actually take a step back, uh, look at the operator along uh, with the control pane on the Kubernetes cluster, this actually looks like a managed service. The user always interacts with the service by making changes to the custom resource definition. Uh, he either creates it or he updates it, and we want, we want to keep it that way. Let's say if even a job is failing, and uh, you want to recover from an externalized checkpoint instead of a save point, or if your save pointing itself is failing, uh, all this can be done by just making changes in the operator, and the user, all he has to do is just interact with the custom resource definition. Uh, for example, we have one service today which takes in a SQL command from the user and it constructs a corresponding custom resource definition based on the SQL command and it creates it in the Kubernetes. So essentially in what we do is you can just create, submit arbitrary SQL commands and they will automatically be converted to a Flink job that is running. Uh, one future extension that we also want to do is flight. Uh, which is a workflow orchestration system, where you can have a backfill job, which is a bad job, uh, which will generate all the data for you uh, that can be you know, uh, pipelined to a streaming job, and then once the streaming job finishes, you can actually send uh, an email or a notification to the developer. Uh, so all of this is possible uh, because uh, they are, first they're all in Kubernetes and, uh, and they're all operators on their own. So Flight would, uh, helps us you know, uh, pipe together all of these different interactions, and uh, that's where we want to go in the future as well. 
Uh, lastly, uh, we have been getting a lot of interest al along this work, so we, wa we want to release uh, this repository uh, on all the work as well. Uh, we are targeting last week of April mainly for documentation and uh, licensing work. Uh, at LIP, we are actively building. Uh, we want to say that the status of the project is in alpha, uh, so that you know if we, we end up making some backward incompatible CRD changes, we don't want every, everyone to break. So we want to give us uh, some protection to make sure that okay, it's in alpha. So we are continuously making changes to CRD and also improving it. Uh, but we'd be happy if you guys can you know come out, try it out, run it in a Kubernetes cluster. It's like single step. The best part about doing all, everything in Kubernetes is in one click you can get all of operator and your uh, application running end to end. Uh, we, as usual, we are hiring uh, at Lyft. If all this work excites you, uh, and if you want to work on any of this, please uh, 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 reach out. Uh, we will be happy to keep in touch. And yeah, questions, please. Other questions? Yeah, just a quick question about your Kubernetes uh, configuration. So it might have just been for the demo purpose, but I saw uh, in your template, uh, I saw namespace Flink. Does that mean you're using the same Kubernetes namespace for all of your Flink clusters? Mm, no, Not, so we are, you can change the namespace as you okay, want. Okay, okay, cool. It's, it's just required that the namespace exists. Uh, right, 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 right. right. And then as far as your Kubernetes cluster itself, is it, a, is it the same Kubernetes cluster managing all of your pods for all of your Flink clusters, or do you decouple that from your compute Kubernetes cluster? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so that is still being worked out. Uh, yeah. So ideally where we are targeting is we are going for a tiered cluster approach where we'll have multiple tiers of Kubernetes clusters. One is more like a critical Kubernetes cluster. One is more like uh, non-critical or tier zero, tier one, tier two. And uh, based on your, uh, based on the Flink application and uh, the seriousness or how critical it is, you can route or deploy it to that particular cluster. Uh, in this case, uh, the operator is running within a Kubernetes cluster. So you have operators within each cluster, uh, but the way we are onboarding or way we onboard our users is that we work with them to see what is their, uh, how critical their application is. And based on that, we ask them to you know, go to a particular cluster. Yeah. So it's really like tiered priority clusters, like yes. high, high priority, medium, low kind of thing? Yeah, yeah so uh, just one more thing add to adding to it. Basically, the operators cluster local. All the decisions of which cluster to send the application to is external. Uh, and currently, for example, in Jenkins, uh, and we, we have some uh, labeling system that, to send over, or like the system that we mentioned, flight is multi-cluster and that allows to route to the right cluster. Uh, being, being cluster local gives you a lot of advantages about making decisions because they are very cluster local and they can be done in memory and they're fast and so on. Um, but, uh, but we can have multi-AZ clusters, so in case of AZ failures, you could fail over to another cluster, uh, another AZ through the operator uh, using some sort of uh, taints and tolerations in part. Gotcha, and then one follow-up question. Um, if you have uh, one of your pods, let's say, is running at 100% CPU and fails to heartbeat, you, a lot of time the entire cluster needs to be restarted, right? Do you guys have like any way to gracefully fail over to another pod in case one pod is not able to heartbeat successfully? So, uh, so we've not made any changes to Flink per se. Uh, if the pod fails, then it goes through a regular failover cycle of the, the one task manager dying and a new task manager coming up. But we have not made any changes. Okay. And I think we, we talked to Till about like any other graceful exit scenarios, but that doesn't exist as far okay. as I know. Thank you. <laughs>